welcome to our webinar today. Thanks everybody for for joining in. Uh, we're we're looking forward to a really productive discussion. Um, so I want to just establish a few ground rules. I'm Jonathan, um, and uh, everybody's muted, so you won't be able to talk. But uh, if you have a question, we would love to hear your question. Um, and you can you can ask your questions in the Q and A panel. Uh, we'd love to hear where you're from when you ask the question. So go ahead and tell us that if you're comfortable. Um, if you have a message that you want to send just to uh, to our panelists, uh, you can use the chat to do that. Um, but if you want everybody to see your question, do that in the questions. Um, otherwise, uh, Keith is going to, uh, I guess I'm going to hand it over to Keith. And then Keith, you can tell us about our topic and our guest today. Yep. Thank you, Jonathan. Appreciate the introduction there. Well, thanks everybody for joining us uh, on this first day of June. Gosh, it's hard to believe it's uh, June already. To, uh, time is certainly flying past. So we appreciate uh, all of you taking time out of your busy schedule to be on our webinar. You know, as we were talking as the sales team about, you know, what should we be looking at doing for our next webinar? Uh, the the topic of fallow came up and uh, so it got me thinking about the fallow fallacy because a lot of people think, well, if I fallow my ground, it lets it rest, it lets it capture more moisture, it lets it capture all these nutrients. And and, and I will admit, I probably used to be of that mindset, uh, you know, that, that that would be truly resting your ground. But since we've been headed down this soil health path, the regenerative agriculture path, what we have learned is that there's nothing more destructive for the soil than to have nothing growing on it out there. We used to think we were great farmers when we would harvest our wheat in, in July, and then we would keep it bare. We'd spray the weeds, we'd keep nothing growing out there for almost 10 months until we planted corn the next year. And, and we thought that, you know, that made us really good farmers by having that nice clean field. And again, what we've learned over the years is that that was not the best thing for that ground. We were doing nothing to build the soil. And in fact, we were decimating the biological populations that, that we would have had out there. And so as we were thinking about this, I thought, who better to address this type of topic uh, than, than Nicole Masters? And so I reached out to Nicole. Uh, and uh, if many of you uh, know Nicole, uh, know of her, have maybe have uh, read her book, uh, For the Love of the Soil. She'll, she'll probably talk a little bit more about that later. But Nicole is, is what I would consider to be one of the top uh, agroecologists. I'm not exactly sure what, what title she would give herself, uh, but she is one of the top people, uh, not just in the United States, but in the world. She actually is from New Zealand and has worked all over the world with farmers all over the world. So she has a vast amount of experience of how plants and biology build the soil. And in the absence of them, which is what fallow is when nothing is growing, in the absence of plants and biology, how destructive that is uh, to your soil and to the process of trying to regenerate or build your soil health. So we asked Nicole if she would be willing to share some of her thoughts, some of her uh, experience in working with other farmers around that topic. And fortunately, we were able to find a time frame that worked because she is one busy lady, travels a lot, does a lot of workshops, does a lot of seminars, uh, and has some pretty exciting things coming up. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that at the end of the webinar. We'll give you just a little sneak peek into some of the new things that Nicole has going on. So. With that, I am going to turn it over to Nicole, and she is going to share with us the fallow fallacy and, and why we need plants and biology to build their soil. Nicole? Wow, Keith, that was quite the introduction. <laughs> I don't know if I feel like uh, I'm all that. Uh, and as far as labels, not really one for labels, but yes, agroecologist is probably as close as I would get. To a label. So what I'm really going to focus on on this session is more around the, the incredible positive things that we can do to build and focus on this soil health approach. Um, I think someone's not on mute. Maybe it's you, Keith, if you want to check on that. Uh, and for those of you that have been involved, with soil health for a long time, you're probably very familiar with the soil health principles. And the idea behind a principle is 
having a framework and having something that actually guides actions when you're looking for some kind of outcome. So some of these um, will be familiar to you in terms of um, some of the these principles, you might call them different things. You might have other principles that you are farming or ranching by. Um, but for us, we talk about having a collaborative mindset. That is a mindset of collaboration with nature, with relationships, with people, with communities, and really looking at how do I collaborate in order to um, in improve my outcomes. Looking at maximizing photosynthesis, we'll talk about that a bit. Keeping soil covered, we're definitely going to dig into this one. Uh, optimizing and reducing inputs as an outcome to improve soil health. Thinking about your context. If we have, um, systems always have disturbance. So really thinking about optimizing disturbance rather than avoiding disturbance. It is part of natural systems. And encouraging a diversity of plants and animals, and we will touch on that. But what I want you to think about is that our paradigms of what really shape and form what practices become available. So your paradigm encompasses those mindsets, what then becomes possible in terms of the principles that we have and the practices. So Keith really just touched on that before. If we're thinking about um, what's possible or what practices we might do in an industrial mindset or an industrial model that's going to be very different from people that are considering how do I build soil health or maybe people that are like their paradigm is that everything is energy and everything's connected your your paradigm is going to shape what principles you follow and what practices and then it's mutually reinforced so some of the things we're going to talk about um are true in a conventional industrial model that that those practices and those principles create these outcomes and they are a truth and they're a truth for people that are working from within those particular paradigms so i don't really go around um trying to force people to change a paradigm it is what shapes how you see the world but it's through seeing something new that we can step out of some of these paradigms. And that's where I think the practices that we're going to talk about today might actually offer an opening into other ways of seeing the world and other ways of seeing what could be possible. So context is a huge one. And, and so I often hear, um, oh, you know, that, that, that there's this practice that works very well and maybe that is in New Zealand or it might be in Virginia. We've got people on this call from Utah, um, from Nebraska, from Arizona, Montana, is that the, these contexts can be shaped by your actual environment. They might be shaped by your soil type. Do you have a very, very heavy gumbo soil? Have you got um, alluvial soils? Have you got ash soils? <laughs> have you got sand? That is going to shape your context for what becomes possible, you know, and, and I know some people in the last few years have had, you know, less than three inches of rainfall, that's definitely going to shape what becomes possible. And your context is also shaped by who you are, what your goals are, what's important to you is going to very much shape what's what becomes possible. And so I think not putting too much pressure on ourselves to try and replicate what you might see someone doing on the other side of the world of really finding what's going to fit well for you in your context. Okay. So why is it so important? Why do we have a principle of keeping soil covered as a soil health principle? Well, one, if we've got cover, then we're going to actually be able to reduce erosion from either wind or water. We're going to reduce that impact impact from raindrops. You think about that catastrophic impact if soils are just bare. Uh, when that raindrop hits it, the shearing potential, so we end up with soil crusts, we end up with soils that don't breathe, that won't infiltrate water. And when we see that, then we'll start to see specific plant weed species that can be induced to germinate when soils stop breathing. And there's probably quite a few that you know of. Uh, if we keep soil covered, we can dramatically reduce evaporation. Um, again, it depends on your context, but there's some research to show that you can be reducing evaporation by as much as 50% by having some kind of litter, some kind of cover just to protect that surface. Uh, we also find that you can reduce salinity by keeping ground covered. So the practices of reducing and taking any kind of material off that soil surface are likely to increase salinity as we start to see um, water drawing um, sodium and other minerals up through the soil profile. 
we can mitigate climatic stresses. So when soils are naked and there's no cover on that surface, then that soil temperature can change dramatically. It can change by like uh, 70 degrees we've seen in some places by having bare soil, by having, um, even with cloud cover coming past the sun, we can see dramatic changes in the temperature of that soil. That's gonna have an impact on your microbiology. That's gonna have an impact um, on all of that soil structure. By having soil covered, we can provide a habitat for microbiology and beneficial insects. So often we think, oh, well, if you've got ground cover, then you're going to have insect pests, you're going to have slugs. Those are all happening because of an imbalance in that microbial workforce. So the, the view that if you have ground cover and you have slugs is true in a conventional context because you don't have the predators, you don't have the nematodes that are eating the eggs of, um, of slugs, for instance. So that's just one example of, as we start to build this system and build more resilience, that we see more and more beneficial insects and microbiology. We also see a reduction in pests, weeds, and diseases um, by keeping soil covered. And we increase our nutrient availability. I want you to consider that um, minerals, particularly in potassium, is all about having ground cover. It's all about having leaf litter um, and all those solar panels up there, increasing that bioavailable potassium to your following crop, right? So all of these are what we call feedback loops. They are positive feedback loops. If we end up taking off all the ground cover, we end up in a negative feedback loop. So instead of having um, carbon sequestration further down the profile, we have greenhouse gas emissions. We, um, by influencing that nutrient availability in a downward spiral, we can have lower quality of litter. And what we're seeing is operations now that may have three or four years of stubble buildup because of the quality and the microbiology that's happening in these systems. So now we're seeing producers actually having to burn to deal with stubble buildup um, because they don't have quality in that, in that litter. So, and, and in the same place, if we're looking at a downward cycle, then we could end up with more pests and pathogens by not having carbon being allocated further down the profile, um, by stressing these plants, um, by not having adequate cover. All right. I'm going to leave you to manage any questions that come up. Okay, so maximizing photosynthesis. Uh, uh, this really is how we plug into the sun. So I want you to really just imagine that the plants are like a plug that you've just gone up, stretched up to the sun and plugged into the sun to capture all that free energy. The whole planet is driven by this process, which enables us to breathe oxygen and live on the planet. Uh, but carbon that, and uh, you know, there's many materials, but carbon being one of them is the currency that drives the planet. So we really want to look at how do I increase plant photosynthesis? Plants are very inefficient at, sun at sunlight capture in many ways. Um, and when we look at systems with high inputs, uh, poor soil health, we find very inefficient plant photosynthesis. So if you are seeing that situation, um, first you want to look at what's happening with plant nutrition. If there are any stresses on plants, is that affecting plant photosynthesis as well as um, stimulating and feeding microbiology? We want to ensure that we have living roots for as long as possible. And I know for some of you that's a challenge, uh, short seasons. Um, yeah, uh, but looking at how do we maximize that? Even if plants only grow this big and then they're terminated by frost or snow, um, just to have that living root in the system can be incredibly beneficial. Uh, having a diversity of plants with different leaf architecture, so we're capturing sunlight before it hits the ground uh, and really looking at how do we build soil carbon and the beneficial metabolites. And we're not gonna have time to really dig into that today, I don't think, but the huge benefits that we're seeing from having diversity and biomass of microbiology that are releasing these metabolites that are so important for plant defense and so important for human nutrition. So if we're thinking about this carbon cycle, uh, uh, and for some of you, this might be a little basic, but for others, this might be a new, a new topic to you, is there are a few cycles of carbon happening in the soil. So the, the, the short cycle, uh, that top part, that top spiral or top circle, 
Uh, I call this, I'm here for a good time, not a long time honey cycle. This carbon cycle is uh, plant roots. This is leaf litter. This is stubble. This is manure, urine, dead bugs, that kind of thing, right? So some of that um, carbon is there for a very short time. You notice it's stomata on the underneath of a leaf to actually take, they will preferentially take carbon that's coming off soil surfaces over the carbon that's coming out of the atmosphere. And in part, it's because it's more concentrated at that surface. So every day that the, the soil is breathing in and breathing out. So there's this respiration cycle that's very, very important. It drives plant growth. Then if we move further down through that process, we have what we um, is termed the deep, stable or recalcitrant protected carbon. And where this is coming from is through the relationship of mycorrhizae with plant roots. So the plant is capturing sunlight energy, drawing in carbon, di carbon dioxide and water, and then converting that into carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, carbohydrates, and then releasing oxygen, right? Part of that carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen is passed down through the plant and released as exudates to stimulate microbiology around the root system and also to pay that mycorrhizae for its services. Okay, so that carbon is being put down much further through the profile. Um, typically, we're looking at 40 centimeters to 60 centimeters depth is where we see that expansion of this more protected soil carbon. Right. And that really is your bank account. It's the hospital. It's the pub <laughs> of that soil environment for microbiology to um, be sharing resources for them to um, be able to find and access nutrients like phosphorus or zinc and then to be able to pass that to the plant for those plants to be healthy. Right. So and it, it's an incredibly complex system. I'm making it overly simplistic. But basically what we're talking about is by having living plants, we are now build that, that carbon building block for water holding capacity, for nutrients and um, bioavailability of all of these different aspects that's gonna to contribute to your bottom line. Okay. You can visibly see it in some soils. So this photograph here was taken um, in sandy soils in Western Australia, uh, underneath perennial grass. Um, establishment. So what you can see is those soils literally look like they're bleeding. That um, soil pit there is six feet deep. So you can see that carbon is actually looks like it's dripping, right? So the dark gray color is your carbon. You can see it concentrated up there in the topsoil, but really it's moving right down the profile. So when we think about building soil and building soil carbon, it's really a process that's happening from deeper down and coming up, right? So how do we get um, more and more of that material laden down through that soil profile, right? One of the other ways you might see it is through what we call um, the rhizosheath, uh, that lovely sticky substances that's all uh, attached to your roots. And again, what we've got in here is carbon, but it's also mucilage. It's byproducts of the roots being shed. It really is the hive of activity in a soil. And what's really interesting is in this rhizosheath, that may be as much as two units of pH difference between the rhizosheath and out in the main soil environment. So you might have saline soils, you might have a pH of nine. Those soils, that plant is experiencing a pH of seven because of that buffering of the microbiology around those roots. So it protects them against fluctuations in temperature, fluctuations in pH, issues like aluminum, heavy metals, and protects them against pathogens. So having a healthy plant that's able to pump those sugars, pay for those services as we see the buildup and we see these beautiful rhizosheaths forming, even in the most extreme of environments. Now you will see these in heavy soils. You can see them in sandy soils. Often they show up more in sandy soils, um, but oh, and show up on most species. It's only things like um, onions, asparagus, uh, what else? There's only a few species where this doesn't show up, but pretty much, you know, all of your um, cultivated plant species will develop a rhizosheath, right? So start digging holes and taking a look. Do I see this kind of development? And then you think when that plant's harvested, the huge amount of organic material that's being returned into the soil system, right? And that amount of root material 
say in a annual wheat, maybe as much as 3000 pounds an acre of root mass. And as we get into perennial systems, that may be as much as 36,000 pounds of root material being returned to the soil environment uh, to stimulate microbiology. So as we get more perennial systems going, then we're gonna get more organic material obviously being put bound into the system. So when we start to see environments where uh, people are taking plants off, um, we see long fallows. So this system on the left, this soil here had actually been under a fallow for three years. Um, and what we see in these situations is total collapse of those soil structures. So we get uh, surface crusting and we lose our aggregates, our crumbs, which are the reactors for nutrient transfer um, and energy in any soil environment. And so what happens, you can look at this example of just kosher, is these create the conditions for um, primitive, what we call bacterial dominated weed species that they love what happens in these bare soils. So one of the side effects of having soil uncovered like this is the buildup of nitrates. And then you're gonna get your nitrate loving plant species. So uh, kosher would be one of them, um, foxtail barley grass, uh, fat hen, lamb's quarters, red root pigweed, um, Russian thistle, there's a bunch of them that love nitrates. So when we get that nitrate hit, so soils might've been bare for some time, you get a small amount of rain and it's enough to trigger the germination for plants that are literally gonna mop up this excess of nitrate um, because they, one, they can deal with nitrates in the environment and they're, they're gonna take that out um, and not make it so bioavailable, which is important for, for landscapes. but. We know that kosher in some environments, people are losing as much as 90% of production to the invasion of kosher. It is a biological problem. It's not due to a lack of herbicides. I believe that um, kosher may be now herbicide resistant to five different um, herbicides. It's not a herbicide problem, people. It's a, bio, it's a biological issue. Uh, what can we do to build aggregate structure um, and to mitigate these losses of things like nitrates? Uh, so that we don't get the germination signal for these particular plants. And we can talk about that more if you want to. One of my ahas a couple of years ago was uh, we were digging holes in Colorado and on this property, we could not get the backhoe through that soil. And the ranchers said to me, well, it's just, you know, soils are frozen um, here in Colorado in winter. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, we don't have this problem in New Zealand. And I'm like, okay, that just must be normal. <clears throat> And then we went um, maybe half a mile up the road on the same soil type that had been managed totally different. And the backhoe went through this soil like a knife through butter. This issue of frozen soils like this, not, not talking about a layer of ice on the surface, but the, the frozen layer of soil is a biological issue. What is happening with that aggr aggregation? So you see on the right-hand side, that beautiful crumb structure. Those crumbs are all built by microbiology. You don't build these kind of structures without the presence of microbiology. And it's in relationship to plants. So having living, growing plants on that surface um, with their roots right down, stimulating microbes is how we get these aggregates or these crumbs, these little reactors, right? If we are undermining the activity of microbiology, if we don't have very good photosynthesis, we don't have very healthy plants, uh, we're gonna see these kind of frozen layers. So I think this is really interesting and for us all to be digging more holes and taking a look at what is happening in winter. What you might find is you see this effect underneath the fence line uh, where you've got beautiful aggregates and then out in your field where you've been managing for some time as we get these super frozen soils. Right, so these, these aggregate structures, this is in um, corn on the right and I oh, can't remember what was taken off, wheat, oats on the left. Um, on properties, this is the middle of summer in, in uh, Victoria, Australia, and seeing these beautiful aggregate structures. And in fact, we could drop a penetrometer, so like a tool to look at how tight the soil is. We could drop these right down to the hilt in the middle of summer um, in these soils. And that activity is happening all through microbiology. So what this means is now we have no limitation to water movement. We have no limitation to air movement. Our nutrients are being moved right through that profile. And so uh, I think that's Sorghum Sudan. So see that beautiful 
those beautiful aggregates all attached to that root system. So this is the reactor I'm talking about. So we're zooming in here onto an aggregate. So that crumb and what you see is aggregates themselves are made up of smaller and smaller crumbs. In, in between all of those crumbs is water. So water will be inside the actual aggregates uh, covering, there will be biofilms, because really, if you think about it, microbiology themselves in soils are aquatic organisms, right? So they're living in these films, they need that water, they are inside these little crumbs, um, and in there is where we get gas exchange. So that might be methane, um, carbon dioxide, nitrates, it's all happening inside this reactor. And as we improve soil health, what you see, and, and we see more and more aggregates and more and more aggregate stability, so this means that these aggregates, these crumbs will stick together, is we see a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, um, we see a reduction in leaching, and a reduction in things like erosion. So the, the, the aim of the game really is how do I build beautiful, sticky chocolate cake um, and have that structure because this is the key to resilience. This is the key to profitability. So this is zooming in actually onto an aggregate. This one is five millimeters in size, which is a fifth of an inch. And they've actually zoomed into that single crumb and inside that crumb is all of these pores. So those yellow little bits, that's all holes and air spaces and water spaces. Microbiology have actually woven through that um, small earth organisms, worms, all the rest of it would have been creeping and crawling through that. Probably not a worm, it's a little small. But um, And what that means is that we've got gas exchange, right? What it also means is that these soils are more resilient to the use of herbicides. Uh, they're, they're more resilient to um, bioaccumulating and bioremediating chemicals. So uh, for some of you, there's no getting away from chemicals. It's in the rainfall in America. Um, it's in your irrigation water. It's just in water. These aggregates are actually able to bioaccumulate and help to reduce chemical loadings, right? And take that out of the food chain, um, right? So we end up in a vicious cycle when we start to lose aggregate structure, when we start to get compaction, what you find is these compacted tight soils they need more nitrogen and they're gonna lose more nitrogen. We see a significant reduction in yields. So uh, you might've noticed this if you ever have a field that you drive through a lot um, that you can see where the vehicle goes because there's less growth and there's less growth there because of this compaction effect. And what some people have is this compaction effect across their entire property. So up to 10 times more nitrogen is lost from compacted soils, which means we need more inputs to maintain production. So I want you to dig a hole, take a look. Have you got compaction up in that top layer? Have you got a surface crust? Have you got compaction down in the play, plow pan, right? All of that is impacting on your bottom line and your profitability, right? So under bare fallow, what we see is aggregate stability can totally collapse. Um, in some studies, like 100% degradation of aggregate stability. So how well these crumbs hold together. Um, so this, this soil, oh, I can't even remember where the soil was. Anyway, um, <laughs> this is what we call a very bacterial soil. You can see all that structure has collapsed. This is one way that you can tell is do yourself a favor and do a slaking test. Now, all you've got to do is find soils from in this case, three different places. So under a fence line or somewhere that hasn't been disturbed is a good start. Um, maybe a soil that's your best soil and your soil that's your worst. Often I find people wanna choose their neighbors. Uh, so look at what the neighbor's doing. And what you wanna see is that that water stays clear. So in, in each of these cases, um, the water on the left-hand side has been under biological management. They have been using um, diverse multi-species cover crops. Uh, they've been using um, both of these, actually. We're still using uh, some chemical herbicides, but they were buffering them with uh, microbial foods. And what you see is uh, without all this mucilage and all of these byproducts of microbiology, so I talk about the poos and the wheeze and the spit and the vomit from microbes, they protect the aggregate. They, they keep that aggregate from collapsing. Whereas if you don't have a lot of active biology, then the water comes into these aggregates, rushes in and the aggregates collapse and you see that going into suspension like that. So the water becomes dirty. Um, you'll see aggregates just falling out. 
There is an app called Slakes, S-L-A-K-E-S. Um, and if you get the app, you can just use single aggregates and take photographs of them in exposure to water and it'll give you a score for how good is your aggregate stability. This is one of the simplest tests and one of the most enlightening in terms of, am I part of the problem? Um, yes, yes you are, no. <laughs> so this is what happens when we have soils that slake. Uh, I know there was a there was an event in 2013 in Iowa, the, Iowa when they lost five tons of topsoil in one week um, during heavy rainfall events. Uh, we see these kind of events across the planet. Our biggest um, export in the U.S. Uh, is is soil, right? So we're losing on average about 5.6 tons per acre per year of soil, um, depends where you are. There are places in the Midwest that can be losing as much as 100 tons per acre per year. It's a significant problem. This is a biological problem. Where is the relationship with the living plant? Uh, where's that relationship with microbiology to hold those soils together? I love this image from Kim Deans. She's in Tinga, um, New South Wales, Australia. Uh, this was post um, a significant fire that had hit the region in 2019. Um, the fence line is looking out towards her neighbors. So um, Kim and Angus Deans are on this side of the fence. They have been practicing adaptive grazing management, um, biodynamics, using biologicals for a long time. But what's interesting to me is that the dust storm literally starts and finishes on that fence line. And that dust storm went for weeks that the soil is moving where they don't have um, adequate microbial activity. These guys were, I don't like talking too much about neighbors. I hate some of these neighbor photos, but um, they were, over, yeah, there wasn't a lot of ground cover, right? So a lot of overgrazing um, and poor management of soils. So what we see is that that erosion and that dust has actually been formed by a lack of microbial activity. And then these guys got rain, so the same fence line, and the rain arrived, and, and it didn't stop for about three years, I believe. But the, when the rains arrived, everyone was celebrating because their dams were filling up. And if your dam is the first thing to fill up or your ponds, um, that's not a good sign, right? That's telling you that you do not have um, poor structures, you do not have infiltration. It literally looks like a lake starts on the other side of the fence. This is this this is a level playing field, right? There, there's no change in elevation. Um, water literally cannot move into these soils. This is something um, to be very, very concerned about, right? Um, we talk about water holding capacity. There's If water can't even get into your soils, uh, it doesn't really matter if you are um, bear fallow or cover crop if if water's not moving water's not moving so the other consideration i think around keeping ground bare is that there's some pretty good research to show that this is having an impact on the climate so when we have bare soils um what it does is it can push the atmospheric boundary up and in this particular study they found that the atmospheric boundary actually lifted by 800 meters which is 800 yards, I can't put it in defeat, sorry, um, which is significant. Um, and what that does is it, it pushes away rainfall, it reduces precipitation. The couple of studies in uh, Saskatchewan, Montana and Western Australia showed that it was reducing precipitation um, by up to 20%, right? So the impact of just clearing land has it has so many flow on effects, but I think this is one of them that we need to be thinking about is that what we're doing properties actually has flow on effects downstream. So what effect are we having by clearing land and keeping it bare right through the growing season? It's just something I'm gonna leave you with. All right, and then diversity of plants and animals. So the more diversity of plant species that we get into the environment, into a soil, then we're gonna have different types of root architecture. We're gonna have plants um, reaching and making different nutrients available. They're also talking to different types of microbiology and communicating underneath that soil surface. So we are getting a huge range of these beneficial metabolites. Uh, we're getting multiple benefits for the ecosystem, um, for the environment and for food and for, uh, our inputs, right? So being able to reduce inputs through having a diversity of root architecture. So something that's kind of fun to think about. I also think that there's something in this in 
thinking about what have we done with many of our modern cultivars. So this is uh, Corazon or Kamut wheat on the right, modern wheat on the left. Uh, some of our modern plants varieties have lost the ability to communicate to microbiology. Um, many of the modern varieties no longer communicate to mycorrhizae. You're very important carbon pump through the soil system. They don't communicate with some of the protozoa and these protozoa are responsible for nutrient cycling and consuming bacteria and all the rest of it. Uh, we're really um, undermining our ability to build soil carbon and soil structure just through thinking about what plant species are we using. And I'm seeing more and more plant breeders think about this because the resilience of the plant on the right compared to the left is measurable in terms of what's happening with um, dry, or wet, or any of the extremes is that these plants have more resilience. I'm going to leave that. All right, I'm going to finish with this. So how many seasons do you have left to build for health? And so the study came out in 2021 um, and found that using LIDAR, LIDAR and satellite imagery, there used to be 14 to 16 inches of this beautiful A horizon, what we call the topsoil in the Midwest. Um, some uh, probably some of the best soils in the world, except for maybe areas in the Ukraine. They've estimated that around 35% of topsoil has been lost across this corn belt. That means 35% of people of these soils are on subsoil. People are farming on subsoil. It's costing Midwest farmers around $3 billion a year in lost revenue and lost performance and productivity. What is it going to take for us to get our soil resources back? And so the dust storms that we're seeing now uh, globally, uh, it's not getting any better. So what we're doing on the land impacts well beyond the farm gate. So I'm gonna leave that with you and then um, let's just have a chat with Keith. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. But boy, <laughs> so, many, so many different paths we could take on uh, following up with that. You know, I really liked what you had to say at the beginning, you know, about it. It really is a paradigm shift. And, and for so many of us, uh, it, you know, once you start down the road to changing the paradigm on what what does a good field look like? You know, for us, uh, initially, that paradigm was not having anything growing out there because we wanted to conserve our moisture in that fallow period. But now we understand that, you know, when we don't have plants growing, we don't have biology. And so much of what you talked about, you kept saying it's a biological problem. It's a biological problem. Well, if you don't have plants growing out there, that's a biological problem because you're not going to have the biology. Uh, and, and that's the, uh, to me, that's one of the biggest fallacies of fallow is that we are not going to be able to host that biology and promote the biological communities without that living plant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we got a lot of good questions rolling in. We're going to start with an easy one. This is this will be like the the the, the way to get started, and and it really uh, uh, segues off what you left us with there. Phil is asking. Uh, so if we would have had the ground covered, would that have helped avoid the dust storm accident in Illinois a few weeks ago, where all the I don't know if there was seven, eight, nine different people killed? Uh, on the highways there in Illinois because of the dust blowing. Yeah, 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 absolutely, Phil. And, and we saw this in Montana as well um, with people killed um, on the highways due to dust storms. Uh, it, it's, when you look at it, I want you to imagine that like the finest particles in dust of what's moving off the pasture, the finest particles in soil is your humus, it's your carbon. So it's the first thing to leave. So often if you're seeing something like that, you're like, wow, someone's literally blowing dollars out the window. And that dust storm went from right up in Alberta all the way down to Texas. Like it was just phenomenal dust storms. Um, it just continuing because of the disconnect with, with life. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, you know, and, and it's understandable in areas that have been in drought and just you, there's no moisture to get a cover crop up and going. But, you know, in Illinois, it would be very rare that they wouldn't get enough moisture to at least get something planted. And I, I want to go back to a comment that you made earlier. 
uh, and maybe have you expand on it a little bit because this this goes to the same issue. You know, you said a plan only has to be yay big, and I'm not exactly sure how how big yay is in order okay. to do benefits. Yeah. But talk a little bit about you know because mm. these guys are typically in a corn soybean rotation, like many of us are. But rye can be planted yes. really late and still get some growth. How much growth of rye mm -hmm. do you think it, there would have had to have been to, to not only stop the dust, but but to uh, really encourage the biological communities to, to, to be working on that uh, surface compaction, all those things that you talked about? Mm. It's, it's a good question. And, and I'm it's more from my own anecdotal experience than than seeing it in the research. But I really think that even when a plant is two or three inches high, yay big, <laughs> you know, it's going to depend on how well, you know, did you put, um, and you guys do this anyway, you are putting microbials on with your seed, but bio-priming those seeds. So we find that actually this, there can be a really robust root system, um, even if the plant's only that tall. Um, we've seen some phenomenal um, effects in in soil aggregation and soil structure and breaking through hard pans in plants that were less than a month old. So there are, and you'll see this Keith all the time, I'm sure, there, there, there is some um, incredible activity. And one of the things that happens is when seeds actually break germination, there's a, there's a whole lot of really powerful enzymes involved in that process. So even that initial, um, what we call strike and you guys call germination, if that initial strike, um, is releasing enzymes into the soil to catalyze a whole lot of activity. So it doesn't necessarily have to be growing for very long to see a benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, you know, that's why cereal rye is such a popular cover crop because we know we can plant it super late into the season and, and all it has to do is, is, is germinate or strike as you call it, and it'll come like gangbusters then come spring. And so you know, when people tell me that they've run out of time in the fall to plant cover crops, I, I have to push back on that a little bit because it's almost never too late for cereal rye. For a lot of the other things, yeah, I, I totally get that. And we love planting diverse mixes. But you know what? There's no shame in planting monoculture cereal rye if it's late enough and that's all you can do because it's a whole heck of a lot better than doing nothing. But I mean, I think if you're going to put a cereal rye in, why wouldn't you put some vetch or winter peas or something that potentially could winter over? You know, is it? Yeah, and, you know what, what we've seen is if when you start getting out into mid-November, even late November, Thanksgiving time, that vetch will come in the spring, but it, it's so slow. It, it really depends on the producer's goals. If they have the time to let it grow out and, and mm -hmm. get some production. And in fact, I just saw some test results back from our test plots, uh, and, and I need to go back and verify this, but we just had a vetch sample uh, that the guys pulled last week. We sent that in. This was October planted vetch. Uh, the biomass of that vetch is showing over 300 pounds of nitrogen accumulation. Now that yeah. was vetch by itself, and we had to let it grow until the 1st of June to get that much. Uh, mm -hmm. So vetch can do incredible things if you have enough time to wait for it. Uh, vetch is certainly one that is going to reward you by earlier planting. But uh, anyway, the, the point is, is that there is typically always a window where that, that plant can get planted and you can be getting some good benefits. Uh, Chris from California, uh, he is in an orchard context out there in California. Uh, has a great question, and, and I was out there about a month ago, and so I know what he's talking about here. Uh, he's asking about the water conservation aspect of cover crops and how to monitor the net effect of their transpiration loss, because in California now, they pass some laws, some regulations. They've got what they call sigma out there, and they have to account for the transpiration of what they grow, and so some of the regulations is almost penalizing the use of cover crops because that transpiration is getting counted against them and they're not getting the full credit for the benefits that the cover crops will bring. So uh, why don't you talk maybe a little bit about how the cover crops, obviously they're gonna use moisture to grow, but how do they help conserve water on the back end of them uh, being used within a rotation? Yeah, and I think this comes back to the paradigm piece again. And if you look in, if you look at a lot of the literature, and we're talking about 
Um, and there's a question later on, I think, too, about, about water. The water balance is these studies are done in, in conventional systems, industrial managed systems or greenhouses to try and compare like water, your water balance and, and then what is happening with transpiration, but also what is happening with water holding capacity. And um, I was at Apricot Lane Farms oh, like six weeks ago and they had 11 inch rainfall that week. And every single drop was held on that property. I mean, mostly, you know, so you, you, we could go and dig holes and sit on those soils the following day and there was no mud. Um, it was just this sponge, it was just incredible. And then you're surrounded by properties that are literally just shedding water off them. And then we're coming to policy that's saying, oh, you've got to account for your transpiration, we'll penalize you on that, but we're not going to account for how much water are you holding? How are you slowing water down? Um, how much organic matter and, and so I think there's there's so many parts to this question Chris but I think we really need to kind of get together as a community to be um, raising awareness to the to the benefit of soil health rather than trying to reduce it to all its different component parts and not be looking at what is happening in a whole system um, because yeah there there is a transpiration we and we actually want transpiration because, and if you look at some of the studies with Milan Milan in the Mediterranean, uh, they discovered that 80% of rainfall is happening from moisture within the catchment, which you guys call a watershed. We need to change language. But within the catchment, there's, a, there's something being transpired and dropped and transpired and dropped and transpired and dropped. And, and we suddenly want to, oh no, we don't want to have any transpiration. We don't want to have any water being given to your neighbors. And if I think about what is one of the least um, socially responsible acts, that's one of them, not, not sharing water. Um, I'm not asking, answering your question, Chris, sorry. Yeah, but, but, it, but it's a great point. And, you know, unfortunately it's hard enough to shift the paradigm of a farmer who's out there and sees it and understands it all the time. It's infinitely yep. harder to change that paradigm of a policymaker who doesn't understand any of these agronomic principles. And that's gonna be a real challenge, not just in California, but that's gonna be a real challenge across all of the West. And it's gonna move uh, you know, into the High Plains and into the Midwest and the Corn Belt as well, no doubt about that. Yeah. Um, so Dwayne, Dwayne Dodsworth, uh, and I, I believe Dwayne is from uh, Western Kansas. He's got a follow-up question on this. Uh, he's asking, uh, in a lower moisture environment, like, you know, like Western Kansas, where they do a lot of wheat fallow, you know, that's just traditionally been a, a rotation. You're very familiar with that from uh, Australia as well. How does one balance living roots in the soil, you know, from a cover crop versus having moisture for that cash crop? Yeah. And I think this speaks to, um, are we having a long-term focus or a short-term focus? So. It, when we talk about the, these paradigms, it is true that there is, uh, and we look at just one soil to another and go fallow is going to have um, a higher water balance, but not in the long term. So what I suggest is that people actually start trialing this in an area that's not going to, you're not going to lose the farm in the process of really looking at building soil health in an area and, and moving away from um, the fallow mentality and take a look and, the, and it, it does look like it's taking up to seven years for, for some in some regions for people to see oh actually I'm now ahead of the curve so producers are finding that they will have higher yields in the dry season and equivalent yields in a good season once they've built that soil health but it's a really challenging thing to do when when many of us are in super low low rainfall times and maybe this is a challenging time for us to be building um, this water balance. But I do think um, you've got to be able to weigh this up in your own context and, and just start so that you can see for yourself how long is it going to take and how well is it going to work for you and your in your region. Yeah, that's a great answer. And I and I would just kind of tack on to that, too. You know, it, it's a lot about, you know, the context of how you're using it, certainly in those environments you can't do a cover crop and then come right back in with a cash crop immediately. But, but you can do a cover crop if you have sufficient recovery and recharge period of time. So if you plant a cover crop in March, 
terminate it in June and then you're not planting wheat until September or October, well, that's, that's a long period of time to recapture the moisture that's used. You have the benefit of preventing that evaporation. You've got uh, almost 100% infiltration. Uh, so it, it's really about how it's used within the context. And then, you know, probably another way, and I really like what you say, Nicole, about, you know, don't do it in a situation where you're betting the farm. Do it on, uh, you know, take your worst field and and maybe convert it away from cash cropping and switch it over to a livestock grazing base because it doesn't take nearly as much moisture to grow forage as it does to grow grain. And then yeah. that gives you the ability to cash flow during that transition period, uh, Nicole, like what you were saying. And then once you get that up and going, now you can switch that over back into the grain rotation and take another parcel mm -hmm. and start working on uh, you know, building that up. So we've seen people do that pretty successfully uh, yeah. as well. Yeah, and I think it's a good technique. I hate that people always want to give me their worst field though. <laughs> Like, if you want to go faster, get those big fields. But yeah, I, I get it. And, it. and it does, it makes so much sense. Um, well, you know, the, the, the worst field is the least opportunity cost for you to try because, you know, you're probably going to be lucky to break even on that one anyway. Everybody has a field like that. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, I, want, I want to throw yeah. biomorphic silica in there for people to be thinking about as well. So bioamorphic silica is, it's, so silica in soil is the most abundant um, mineral in soil, but it comes in thousands of different forms. The bioamorphic silica is a little bit like silicon in terms of its water holding capacity. So one molecule of bioamorphic silica holds onto 700 molecules of water. Now, soils can be as high as 6% of the entire soil can actually be in this bioamorphic Form, but when we have bare fallow, when we are cultivating, when we're using a lot of ag chemicals, that number drops to below 1%. So there's a, there's a biological component in terms of how soils are made up of and, and what biology are doing in terms of holding on to this moisture to make it available. So um, we're missing a lot of the opportunities by, by yeah, cutting plants' heads off. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Boy, so many questions to choose from. I'm gonna switch it up just a little bit here. Uh, uh, Dr. Gra uh, Gross, Robin Gross, uh, he's down in Arizona now, but he was with the University of Wyoming, bred the Wyo winter peas. Uh, he's asking, uh, most crop cultivars have been bred for conventional farming systems, true. Are plant breeders devoting enough effort to breeding plants for agro ecosystems managed using the holistic practices you advocate? Um, yeah, it's a great question. And what we're seeing is this is coming into the conversations that I'm seeing with plant breeders is they're realizing what, what they were, it's like breeding racehorses. And suddenly you realize that you don't have good feet and really bad behaviors in your horses. And you're like, I should do something about that. Is it, we're seeing the same thing with plant breeders who are now starting to look at epigenetics and now going, well, hang on, if we're not uh, forming relationships with mycorrhizae, that has some significant issues in terms of nutrients and, and resilience. So I feel like it's happening. It's happening in pockets. Part of it's been driven by producers on the ground. So seeing um, farmers themselves saying, hey, hang on, I don't want the neonicotinoids on my seeds. I don't want seeds that have been grown for very high, imp imp you know, high phosphorus, high water, because it's actually not my environment. Um, and so we're seeing some movement in Australia and New Zealand that I find really positive. Yeah, that's a good point. And, you know, we're even doing a few things. We're not, we're not plant breeders. We don't pretend to be. But for cover crops, we try to go back and find the oldest cultivars mm -hmm. we can. So we've got a couple of growers growing turkey red wheat, Scout 66, which was a very popular wheat in 1966. And, and we're growing those and using those as wheat for cover crops uh, in, in a scenario. Because there's some people that, you know, if they're a certified wheat grower, they, they, can't, they can't use cereal rye. And so, you know, wheat is still an option, but we're trying to go back to those really old cultivars, kind of like this picture of the spelt roots that you showed, you know, that has that, that huge uh, root system there. Uh, Andy uh, Van Niekirk is asking, you mentioned that you buffer your herbicide sprays with biological food. 
Can you elaborate on what food can be used? How do you use that? Tell us a little bit more about how you can buffer those herbicides with biology. Um, producers I work with have been using for over 20 years, things like uh, vermicast, so worm extracts and fulvic acids. Um, and on properties where we've been doing this, testing the actual grain that's been harvested and that grain is tested as no chemical residue, even though they may have used um, yeah, post-emergent herbicides, uh, post-emergent, pre-emergent herbicides, sorry. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it is pretty exciting. Some of the work that was done in New Zealand was actually showing that um, there's organisms in the soil and that structure in the soil was actually breaking down things like 2,4-D and bioaccumulating some pretty heavy chemicals. So it wasn't even showing up in soil tests after those chemicals were used. So looking forward to more research happening in this space. Yeah, and there's there's just tremendous amount of uh, people doing different things with you know compost extracts and you know using humates and just do different things like that. So I would encourage you again just to try it on different strips. Uh, you know the the best way to learn is to do small trials on your own operation, uh, and even if it's not replicated, you know you're not doing it to try to you know publish in some journal. You're doing it to yep. prove to yourself does does it work? Does it not? And get with a group, you know, I know Nebraska, uh, our extension agent, Jenny Reese, has a really good group of uh, farmers. They do on-farm research. And so they can do similar projects, but across many different farms. So instead of replicating it four times on your own farm, it's being replicated by some of your neighbors. And then you get together and, and see what you found out. So uh, consider doing that as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Cindy Zink, I know Cindy is the uh, coordinator of the South Dakota uh, Soil Health Coalition. She, she's asking, I think she's talking about that Slake app you were talking about. Oh, yeah. Uh, she's asking if that's available on Apple as well. Do you happen to know on that? I don't speak Apple, not sure. <laughs> uh, I believe so. Yeah, it was developed by um, a university on, yeah, yeah, I, I believe that it is actually. It's really cool. Okay, I hadn't heard of that, so I'm gonna. Uh, that's gonna be one of the things I'm gonna have to uh, go look up and and try to find here. I know we're up against our hour. Uh, I'm gonna and there's a whole bunch of questions here. <laughs> yeah, it's, everybody wants to ask Nicole a question, so we certainly appreciate everybody's enthusiasm there. Uh, we're gonna do a couple more questions, and then we are gonna have to wrap it up here. And also, uh, just for everybody's, uh, we are going to be posting this out on our YouTube channel. Uh, so if you want to watch it again, or if you want to um, have other people watch it, it will be on our uh, YouTube channel here pretty soon. Uh, so we have a question here from Antonio. Uh, first of all, he congratulates you on all your great works. Uh, he oh. wants to know your perspective on the greenwashing of regenerative as a term, uh, yeah, because we all know that's been happening in different places. Mm -hmm. uh, but but how do we prevent that? How does a farm using the principles of regenerative ag can be considered regenerative uh, if it uses the food for the cows from conventional farming? So just what are your thoughts kind of around that subject? Because there's a lot of talk about that. There is. And um, like I started this whole session, I really don't like labels. I'm not interested in the labeling. I'm more interested in the in the outcomes, so seeing organizations that are very interested in, in like New Zealand Merino with the regenerative index, you know, what is happening in terms of improvements of water quality, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, um, food quality, whatever that is. And so um, I think the greenwashing um, stable door is blown open and the horse is well bolted um, when we're looking at a doubling of the use of the term regenerative ag being applied to some of the biggest ag chem um, type food producers in, in the world. So um, I feel like we're going to get more into the actual, you know, sh show me these improvements. What does this look like in, in finding ways to do that? Um, and at the same time, you know, I'm happy if people are taking a couple steps towards this direction, you know, any any steps is going to be an improvement in terms of reducing uh, chemical, you know, chemical ladenness. But, you know, I, I think, Keith, it'd be interesting to look at the amount of cover crops that went in last year and then consider how much more glyphosate went in last year. Like, 
this is where I'm concerned about practice based um, certification is that these are not about practices. You can make any practice degenerative and you can make any practice regenerative. So um, yeah, anyone that's certifying on practices has me very concerned. I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in what are we doing with outcomes and I'm less interested in being able to control the rhetoric on language like people are going to try and yeah. work it. Yeah, we, we definitely have to look at not just individual practices, but what does the system look like? And then, uh, and then, like you say, the outcomes too. But, you know, we, we have to be careful that we don't push away the, the large uh, ag retailers and the CPGs, because if we're really going to move the needle uh, on a large scale across, you know, the, the, the whole world, uh, we're going to need those people as partners. And so it is frustrating. Uh, I know it can be a very discouraging sometimes to work with them, hmm. but but they're going to be a needed partner in some way, shape, or form. So we have to figure out uh, how to kind of work with that. So I'm going to do one more question, Nicole, and then we'll kind of wrap it up here. Adam is asking a question, and this is kind of a near one that's near and dear to my heart. So I'm choosing this as our last one. <laughs> He's saying, can you speak to the benefits of cover crop mixtures when you have multiple species in a mix? and how that can benefit the microbiology of the soil and overall soil health. And I'm assuming he's as compared to maybe doing a monoculture single species cover crop. Mm -hmm. So what's the specific question? Like oh, the benefits of cover crops? The, the benefits of cover crop mixtures okay. versus single species. Mm. Mm -hmm. and, and you have like a minute to give us uh, that. Because that's <laughs> well, I, just, I, I just want you to consider that the exudates that are coming out root systems can be very unique to those particular plants. Um, they may be filling different roles, like some might be attracting this specific fungi, some might be releasing this, you know, specific phosphorus, that every single plant has different complementary roles. And I think you said later you work with uh, cherries and apples, you know, so thinking about in perennial systems, what are the companions for those trees in the wild? Because they were actually offering benefits in, the, in those exudates, in those metabolites for plant defense, um, reductions in weeds and all, all of this. So the more diversity we have in the system, it also gives you a a backup too, if the climate changes, it gets hot, it gets cold, and you've got another species that might kick in. So you're kind of covering your bases. But I also think we're not just growing for ourselves, but thinking, how do I bring more vibrant life and attract a diversity of insects and birds and, and that whole piece? Like, let's stop being selfish. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. And, and, you know, we just have seen so many benefits of diverse mixes because you know, diversity equals resilience. And if you don't know what your weather is going to be, then you just need to try to be re as resilient as possible. So um, definitely where it's at. So again, Nicole, we thank you so much for spending time with us here. I do want to just as we close here, just talk a little bit about some of the things that you've got going on. I mentioned that you're originally from New Zealand. Uh, you recently purchased uh, some property in Montana, which that's very exciting. Yep. I know we yeah. just sent you some seed and hopefully you got that seed planted uh, for your operation there. Tell us, tell us a little bit about what your plans for uh, that uh, little parcel of the Paradise Valley are. We are very excited. Yes, um, six acres doing this um, myself, which is a little intimidating, but um, and working. <laughs> but what we're planning to do is set up an educational center here. So the Underland Lab. And so being able to, to, to show what's possible in Montana um, in terms of some of these species that we're talking about, different plants, different types of composting, vermiculture, um, regenerating with horses, that's a thing. Um, but yes, the education center here will be um, just, just a fantastic focus point uh, on the gateway to Yellowstone. So at some point when you have that all up and running, we can come to a yes. course there and then we can uh, take a little Yellowstone vacation and just have the whole thing all wrapped up. That's right. Yeah, we're going to tie it in <laughs> with retreats and other things. Um, but also our CREATE program, which is the Agroecological Coaches School, we aim to, the goal is to be able to start running it from here instead of, I just got to stop traveling so much. <laughs> Let yeah. other people travel here. And, and so the, so the, 
so the create program is something that people can do now and have been doing and it's it, it's a, it's a 36 week commitment right tell us a little bit yeah. about what what that is and what you get at the end of that um, yeah, so the CREATE program is really for people interested in doing this as a career. So some of you have been involved in regenerative systems for a long time and, and are now potentially looking at what else could you do with that knowledge because it's so needed right now. There's a huge gap in the people providing the extension side, the education, uh, the facilitation consulting and coaching. Uh, so this program is very much around the coaching side. So it's not where you come to learn about how do I build soil health? It's how do I communicate more powerfully around soil health? Um, how do I work with um, others, clients, workshops, whatever that looks like. So we were looking to hire people uh, before COVID and just discovered there's, there were very few people that could do the diagnostics in terms of animal health, plant health, soil health, um, water quality and bring that all together with the human aspect so this program is really designed to round people off in terms of you know you have some amazing skills in this area and then how do we expand in that in that side so yeah there's there's huge opportunities right now for people and this is a great stepping stone and and that's really important because you know we talked about ag retailers earlier and even cpg companies Part of their problem is they can't find people trained in regenerative yeah. principles in order to drive any of these things forward. And I know there's a number of them looking, you know, they ask us and I said, well, you can't have any of my team. <laughs> but nope. I'll keep nope. my ears open for others. And That's so there right. is a real need for this. And there's there's going to be huge, huge job opportunities for people yep. trained in this. So that's that's a pretty intensive one. But you've yep. also got some online courses. I was looking at those just the other day. And in fact, I've got one of my, uh, uh, Kate from our sales team is going to do the horse course, oh, uh, to, to, you know, building soil health with horses. Uh, yeah. but so if, if any of you are interested, Nicole has a, a number of different soil health, uh, regenerative ag training courses on her website, integritysoils.com. And they're, they're, you know, I've looked at a lot of courses over the, uh, over the years, and these are as reasonably priced as any that I've seen. So check those out, take a look. Uh, she's got all kinds of resources there at integritysoils.com, including your book. Uh, how, how, yeah. how many years uh, has the book been out now? Uh, since 2019 or the end of October, 2019. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, I started writing it in 2017. So I feel like you know, the minute you write a book, you put a line in the sand and then that the water comes up and washes that line away and you're like, oh, <laughs> but, you know, and I, I, I plan to, yeah, to do another, another book, but um, no, yeah. That'd be great. It's yeah. Been and one of the things that I've really appreciated about reading your book is that you, you'll talk about a principle, but then you back it up by talking about, and here's how it was lived out in this farmer that I've worked with. And I think that's really important. So it's not just a book about theory. Uh, it's about successful people, practitioners actually seeing these things work out in the field. And, and that's that's really important. So, so go over to integritysoils.com. You can uh, learn all about all these things. And, uh, you know, again, we appreciate everybody joining us here. I know everybody's time is super valuable. Uh, this will be posted out on our YouTube channel. We apologize for all of you that we didn't get to your questions. Uh, just some great, great questions there. So, Nicole, I'll give you the last word. Oh, no, I appreciate this so much, Keith. I appreciate you guys tuning in. Thank, uh, just always amazes me that people tune in when we have a yarn. So, yeah, thank you very <laughs> much. And hopefully I'll see some of you out in the world. Um, I'm going to be in, um, in Wyoming next week and South Dakota in... Um, August. So yeah, keep an eye out for in-person workshops. And it's, oh, okay. UK, going to be in the UK in two weeks. <laughs> so hopefully are, we see some are, are those different places that you're at? Do you have those listed on your website as well? Yeah, events okay. on the website. Yeah. Okay, great. So again, happy June, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we will be following this up with some additional videos on the fallow fallacy. They won't be live webinars, but we're going to be doing some recordings with some of our customers. Uh, talking about how can we avoid fallow situations, uh, whether it be a corn bean rotation, a wheat fallow rotation. Uh, we're going to be doing some recordings uh, and putting those out on our YouTube channel for you as well. So we'll let all of you know when those videos are coming out. So 
Thanks again, everybody. Have a great day and a great week. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you so much, Keith and team and everybody. Bye.